your Bibles, if you would, turn with me to the book of Mark. We're going to be hanging out in the book of Mark this morning. Hey, I want to invite our church to have such a love and a passion for one another that we become so concerned for one another that we don't just think about praying for people that are in our sight, but that we think about people that we don't even see in this place right now. You need to pray with conviction over them, that God will give them a spirit of, of need that's only found in uniting with His church. They need it. They're hurting. And a lot of that hurt is self-inflicted because they're allowing the things, the cares, and the concerns, and their own passions and all to drive them in other places rather than being where God wants them to be. And I want to ask you to pray for them. This isn't a matter of looking at someone from a, from, a, from a judging point of view. It's looking at someone from a point of view that if you were in that same place, think about what, how you would be and where you would be and what kind of hopelessness you would be attached to by not being where hope is preached and where encouragement is found. And I'll tell you, it's, it's hard, and I know, and I realize that sometimes we get in places and we get in funks and we get disconnected, and then it's easy to continue to stay just disconnected. But we've got to pray the conviction that God does something different. Will you do that with me? Matter of fact, let's take just a moment, and I'm going to pray, and you let whoever it is that came to your heart and mind right now, I want you to pray that, that God's Spirit would do an amazing work on their heart even in this very moment that we pray. Will you do that, Father? We come to you. And Lord, you hear the hearts of your people and you know exactly who's on the heart and mind of every person that's in this place. It may be a loved one. It may be a neighbor. It may be a best friend. It may be another church member that, that the heart is being burdened about. And God, you know not only the the the... the passion of the heart of those who are in this room but you know the face and the life of the one that's that's being thought about and prayed over right now god we pray that the work of your holy spirit and the conviction of your holy spirit would do an amazing work in the life of your people they're your children and god i pray that as a brother in christ i pray for my brothers and sisters in christ who are distracted and, and find themselves in a place where they're disconnected. And God, I pray that you will do an amazing work of unity in their heart. Draw them back into yourself. And God, where we fail you, where we're not being the church that we need to be to make the connections we need to make, I pray that you'll help us to, to change that and help us to take it personal, to breathe life into those that aren't here today. God, we commit these things to you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Preparation. You know, there is a point in our life where we have to understand we got to prepare ourselves. There is a, a sense of essentials that are important in our life. Do you know that? When I played basketball, one of the things the coach used to tell us when we come to practice is don't show up if you've got on dress shoes and you don't have your what? What do we got to have? What's one of the essentials? Not dress shoes, but sneakers. That's, you guys are good, too. See, I think tennis shoes, but I guess tennis, sho tennis shoes are for tennis, right? We're not playing tennis, playing basketball, but they're tennis shoes. They're sneakers. And we don't come to practice without our sneakers. Our coach would tell us, don't come to practice. It doesn't work well if you don't have the right equipment. Sneakers. Not only sneakers, what are some other things? If you're playing basketball... They don't want you to come in pants, right? Pants are, are cumbersome and, they can, and you can't be as free to move and you're not as agile. So they'll tell you to wear gym shorts, right? And then a loose-fitting shirt so that you can play to your ability, that you can give it your all and that you're prepared. Hey, in a car, all of us here that have a license, you understand a car, there are some essentials to a car, aren't there? And I'm going to give you one practical one. And that is called tires. A car has to have tires or it's not going to go down the road, right? Now, I know it's got to have an engine and all that, but we're pretty well talking about the collective cars already put together. But there are certain responsibilities we have and they're, they're consumable things that have got to be put on the vehicle. Tires are one of them. 
And not only just any tire, it's good to have tires with tread on them, right? So that you can go through rain and all that and stay on the road. Having good tires is important. What are some other essentials in a car that you that you're kind of responsible to see that it has? What's that? Gas. Can't go anywhere without the gas, right? You can have a beautiful car and it sets out in the driveway, but it's not going to go anywhere without gas, or if it's a diesel, it's not going to go anywhere without diesel fuel. What else? Oil. Oil is really important. You know, in a car, if you run low on oil, you can seize the motor up because it gets hot and, and then the parts weld together. Got to have oil in a car. What else? What was that? Transmission fluid. Got to make sure that's up. Antifreeze, right? If you don't have antifreeze, the engine gets hot and it overheats. Next thing you know, again, it could seize up and you're in trouble. Oil. Not only, and that was mentioned earlier, but not only oil, but with oil, there's something that comes along with oil. If you're going to do an oil change, you've got to have a, a filter. You've got to make sure the filter's good and changed because otherwise, what good is a, the oil? You could change the oil, but if the filter gets all clogged up, the oil can't circulate, right? There's some essentials, and there's not a lot of them, and I'm shocked and surprised I hadn't, haven't had some. And I told them in the first group, I'd probably have some younger people in our group, they'd go, air condition. <laughs> Well, that can be, it's not an essential. You actually can have, uh, you know, my coach, his air conditioner went out in his car, and he said that he had a 255 air conditioner. I'm like, what are you talking about? So I roll down two windows and go 55 mile an hour. Uh, 255. <laughs> so, well, I guess so. You can go without air condition, but naturally we wouldn't want to very long, but we can. It's not an essential. But the essentials are really important to accomplishing things. If you go to work, there's certain essentials. You might have to dress a certain way, have on hard toe shoes or whatever it might be, depending on where you work, what kind of work you do. There's essentials that you have to have. And, and we've been on this subject of prayer. We started a couple weeks ago, and uh, we've been talking about this area of prayer. And if we're going to understand what it means for us to have a life of prayer, hear me out now, prayer is essential to your life as a believer, but there are some essentials that have to be in place for prayer to be effective in the life of a Christian. And I'm going to talk to you about what those essentials are. It's extremely important that we know and understand. If you would, we're going to look here in Mark chapter 1. Hopefully you're there. And I'm going to begin reading in, in verse number 12 of Mark chapter 1. Are you ready? Here we go. The Spirit... Oh, by the way, before I do, before I do, I want to prep the story because I did last week. Jesus has now come to the age of 30 years old and he's going to begin his earthly ministry. He lived a life of, of, secure, of not being known. <laughs> Can't think of the word I'm wanting to say. I know what I want to say. It's just not going to come out. That life of in, really insignificance in a sense as far as people really seeing his life and it being... Uh, you know, where people knew who he was. But at 30 years old, the Spirit of God led on him. It was time to start his earthly ministry. And so Jesus, what he did in starting his earthly ministry and following his Father, the very first act of obedience that he was living out as an example to us as he went to John the Baptist in the Jordan River and he got baptized. Now, John the Baptist was a forerunner of Jesus, which meant that before Jesus, it wasn't until he was 30, that he began to be known before he was 30 years old. John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness, and, or not in the wilderness, he was preaching to the people, but he hung out in the wilderness a lot, but he would go and he would preach, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his message. And that message cost him a dear price, and the dear price it cost him was his freedom. It ended up getting him put into jail. So we find that before he got in jail, though, Jesus came to the Jordan River, and he was baptized by John, and then when he came up out of the water, look at verse number, uh, we're going to look at verse number 12 there. It says that the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Now Jesus, after he come up out of the water, it was time, he was beginning his earthly ministry, and he was then immediately driven by the Spirit of God, to go into the wilderness, into a lonely, parched, 
dark, parched, lonely place. Now again, I don't know where you're at in your life, but a lot of times when you decide you want to live for the Lord and you want to you want to do the right thing, a lot of times you feel like you almost are walking into a place where nobody else is at in your life. It feels like a very lonely place. Matter of fact, you get pushback from friends who say, oh, come on, let's go to the bar. Come on, let's go do this. Come on, let's go do that. And some of those people might even be those who claim to be followers of Jesus too. They'll ask you to just like set down all your decisions of commitment to the Lord and come on, let's go run and have fun. And you're going, well, you know, wait a minute. Things are changing for me. I've got some things that I'm very committed to now and I can't get distracted by those things. And then they start pounding you with little snide remarks and things that make you feel like somehow you're a second class citizen. Ever have that? I have. I have. I've had people make fun of me. I remember when I worked at PBS Chemical Company. I wasn't even really committed to the Lord that heavily. I was just faithful to church. I was a preacher's kid. They found out I was. And then I would be called every name in the book uh, as far as the holy roller and this, that, and the other. And then next thing you know, there's this one guy. He would say the most vile, filthy things and talk about how that he saw me down the street one night doing this or doing it, and just the most wicked, vile things would come out of his mouth. It's like, what did I ever do to this guy? When we decide to live for the Lord, a lot of times that'll end up coming with a heavy price. Jesus went into this wilderness place, and here he was, and, and there, look at it with me if you would, in verse number 13. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days. Now, can I say this? 40 days is a long time. Did you know that? If you go anywhere and stay there for 40 days, you probably have wore out your welcome. 40 days is a long time. If you don't believe me that 40 days is a long time, invite your mother-in-law to come to your house for 40 days. And you will realize how long 40 days is. It's a long time. 40 days is a long time. Jesus went into the wilderness where there was nothing. No TV, no internet. There was nothing. No cell reception. Nothing. For 40 days. It's a long time. Not only were there not any of those things, there were no restaurants, there was no grocery stores, there was no food to be had. In this desert place. Very lonely, dreary place. He not only was there for 40 days, but by virtue of reading this passage, and by the way, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all four of those Gospels are meant to look at the same things going on with Jesus, but from different angles. It's like looking at a diamond, and if a diamond was big and sitting in front of us, all of us standing around it, could describe it differently, but we're talking about the same thing. That's what the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do. They all look at the same thing from different angles. And so, in this passage, there are certain things that might not be talked about, but you may go to another passage, and you get more clarity out of another book about parts of the story. And so we know through this 40 days that Jesus was in the wilderness, he was there with the intent, and look at it with me if you would, he was there being tempted by Satan. So not only was he in this place where there was nothing around him, there was no conveniences, it was a 40 days, it's a long time. And then Satan was there tempting him and railing him every single day. Day, can you imagine? Have you been there? Being haunted by something that just will not leave your mind alone? I know people who have a hard time going to sleep at night because Satan plays on their mind all the time, creates fears in their head and their mind all the time where they just cannot find themselves in a place of peace. But that's not what God wants for you. 
Even in this place where Satan was constantly railing Jesus for 40 straight days, I believe, though there's only three times that we find some encounters that Jesus had a conversation with Satan, but I still believe that Satan was there buffeting Jesus through this whole thing because we realize, look what it says, that he was there being tempted and he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. And I think that's a beautiful thing that in the middle of all this chaos and all this turmoil and all this temptation, the angels of God were there. And you know what that tells me? No matter where you're at in your life, or listen to me, if you miss anything, I say don't miss this. You're never alone. God is always with you. You might not be connecting with God, but he's still there. Just because your back's turned to him at the present time in your life doesn't mean he's not there. He's there. And he wants you. He's pursuing you. He wants a relationship with you. And we find here Jesus is there in the wilderness for the 40 days being tempted. And, and again, temptation is not sin. Do you realize that? Temptation is not sin. It's the yielding to temptation that is sin. Let me say that again. Temptation is not sin. It's the yielding to temptation that's sin. So, for instance, I've had young people say to me, Pastor, I don't like the thoughts that run through my mind, and, and I just feel like I'm sinning against God all the time because thoughts want to come through my mind. And listen, it don't have to be sexual temptations or thoughts that run through your mind. It may be thoughts of anger or bitterness or all kinds of different birds can fly over your head. But like my dad always said, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your head, on your head. And you can't always stop the thoughts that run through your mind because your human flesh gets angry, and sometimes it wants to be bitter, and sometimes it thinks about things it shouldn't think about. But you don't have to seize those thoughts and allow them to find place in your life. Because the Bible says we, are, we sin when we're drawn away of our own lust and enticed. In other words, it's not the temptation that's the sin. It's the yielding to the temptation that's a sin. It's when I allow myself to become bitter and angry and ugly and spiteful. Or allow those sexual thoughts that may permeate your mind to become a part of your DNA and you allow them the freedom in your life that, oh, well, you just push it off like, well, it's just the way my mind works. No, that's not the way it's supposed to be. You can have the freedom from those things. And so Jesus is here in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 days, tempted the devil. He was around all these wild animals and always having to sleep with one eye open is what I would have done. He probably didn't, but I... That would be tough, right? All I mean, just, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't like scorpions and snakes and tarantulas. Those are what you find in the wilderness and coyotes and buzzards. And, you know, they might mistaken me from somebody who's about to die. I don't want them to while I'm asleep. So I might would just kind of have one eye open thinking, you know, man, you ever feel like that in life? That you feel like you always are looking over your shoulder? Not knowing what's coming next. When we start to live for the Lord, we find ourselves oftentimes in a very lonely place. But verse 14, following, look at it. Now, after John was arrested, again, I told you because he preached, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Got him put in jail. After John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came to, into Galilee proclaiming the gospel and saying, oh my goodness, listen to what Jesus was saying. He was saying the very same thing that got John the Baptist put in jail. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Do you see what's happened here? Jesus found himself in the presence of his Father, and there's something about coming to that place that empowers us to do things that would be unusual. And next week, we're going to talk about the empowerment of prayer. This week, uh, we're, we're not talking about the empowerment of prayer. We're talking about the essentials of prayer. 
So I want you to understand what gets you to that place, though. Let's see what else happened with Jesus. And again, I'm not going to go into depth in this, but we're going to do that next week. But look at it. It says in this passage, passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Now, can I just pause there for a minute? I think this is kind of cool. Side note. I mean, kind of might have something to do with the message because we're on this story, but I thought this was kind of cool. God showed me this this week, just impressed on my heart. You remember when, when the disciples were out fishing and they toiled all night long and they didn't catch anything at all? And Jesus was walking along the shore and he saw them out there and he said, Hey, guys, how's fishing today? Oh, not very good. What do you mean? Oh, we didn't catch anything. He said, I tell you what, why don't you do this? Well, what did he tell them to do? Throw your nets on the other side of the boat. <laughs> why? I mean, even if the other side of the boat was from that wall to that wall, I mean, it's the same water. The note, I don't know if you've ever watched anything. When you throw it in the water, it don't go like this. It goes like this until it falls right underneath of you. Right? So whether underneath of you is right here or right there, I mean, fish swim. They took their nets. Why not? And the Bible says they caught so many fish that the nets were about to break. You know what hit me about that? That's a physical illustration of a spiritual truth that I believe that God was showing the disciples. Here's what he is saying. You are fishermen that catch fish, and, you, and even at your best, you're not doing a real good job of that. I tell you what, let's change the ball game. Let's throw the nets in a different direction, guys. Let's be fishermen of men and watch what I'm going to do with that. Wow. Cast your nets in a different direction. We get so consumed with life. We have certain things we want to see done. We take our own energy and efforts and we give it our very best and we pour our soul and our heart in it only to find out a lot of times we're left disappointed. God says, why are you doing all that? Come follow me and watch what I will do with your life. And yes, I realize you live in the physical and you want to see physical things done, but I want you to live on a realm that your spiritual life is going to make an impact for eternity. Let's throw our nets in a different direction. So what we find here is that uh, Jesus had gone to them and they were fishermen of men. Verse 17, and Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you Become fishermen of uh, fishers of men. And what does it say in verse 18? And what's that next word? Immediately. Not, you know, hold on a minute. Let me go home. Let me go take care of something. Let me pack my, my, uh, my bags. Let me get my toothbrush. It says immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and uh, who were in their boat, mending the nets, and immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Now, oftentimes, I know, you've probably been like I have, where you think that the disciples were out in their little uh, dinghy boat with the, you know, with the paddles or whatever. And listen to me, this was a shipping vessel. This was, a, this was their livelihood. They had employees on this boat. This wasn't a little vessel. This was a vessel with employees. This was their inheritance they were going to receive when their father died. And the Bible says that they immediately left everything to follow Jesus. Now, we go on. And we're going to finish. Uh, oh, no, I did finish. Well, verse 20, we're going to 21. Verse 21 and they went into Capernaum, or to Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue. And what was he doing there? He's teaching. Again, I just want to allude to the fact 
that Jesus walked right into their religious system and he did something that was out of the ordinary and he preached and spoke a message that was not a common message that they would have heard from the Pharisees or the Sadducees. And the reason we know is because you can read on down through there and it says he spoke in a way that was nothing like the, the scribes, the fair, or what was that? I think it says the Sadducees, I believe. It says that he spoke in a way that was not anything like the way they spoke. I want you to know he spoke in a way that, that wasn't, it was nothing like the scribes. That's what it says, like the scribes. Here's what I want you to understand is that it all started at that very point where Jesus realized he needed to get to a place. Hear me out. If you missed anything I've said up to this point, don't miss this. Jesus went into the wilderness in a place where he, re where he had no resource of his own. I don't care what you have, what you have is not going to accomplish what God wants to do. I don't care how good things are going for you. Do you realize, listen to me for a minute, do you realize a lot of times God lets you get in a very difficult place because he wants you to be at an end of yourself? And the reason he has to do that is because you're not willing to get there on your own, so he has to help you get there? Do you realize half of us could prevent a lot of the hardships to come on our life if we would already put ourselves in the presence of God and empty ourselves and realize what we have isn't enough? And even though we have a lot, it doesn't matter anyway because God is the only one that can empower us to accomplish. And when we don't come to that place and God says, okay, I'm going to have to start peeling the onion and we're going to have to get this down to where you realize you have nothing else to depend on. That's all God wants from us anyway. And we self-inflict ourselves. We put ourselves in a place where we don't even realize what we're doing. And all God wants us to do is to find ourselves in that wilderness place. That place where we're willing to get in a place where there are no resources. There's nobody that can help us. Matter of fact, if anything, it's a dangerous place where wild animals are, metaphorically speaking. It's a place where danger's at but that we trust the angels of the Lord to minister to us and to help us in those hard, difficult places of our life. All right. I've kind of given you a snapshot, but I have not yet given you the answer to what the essential parts of prayer are. I just wanted you to see a full picture of what Jesus did and the things that God did with him after he came out of the wilderness so you could see there's some element that's missing that you don't know about yet that I'm going to take you to so that you can see how all these things lined up and for them to happen in Jesus' ministry. You ready to go there? Turn with me a book of Psalm. Psalm 34. In Psalm 34, and we're going to look at verse number 17 through 19. Psalm 34, 17 through 19. Here's what it says. Now, some of you are already beginning to check out on me, and we ain't done yet, but we're almost done, so need you to stay with me. You ready? Here we go. Psalms 34, 17 says, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their trouble. Now, you might say, been there, Pastor. I've cried out to the Lord, but yet he didn't save me from all my trouble. Well, don't stop reading. Verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Amen and amen. But the Lord delivers him out of them what? All. Did you know that God will deliver you out of all your problems and all your trouble and all your heartache? Does that mean that everything's going to work out exactly the way you think? No. But he can rescue you in your heart in the middle of your fiery furnace. God can give you a presence of his own that causes you to be free even in the middle of your bondage and, and trial and temptation and heartache. Because where Jesus is, there's life. Hey, at night when you're laying in bed and you can't go to sleep for nothing, in the presence of God you find peace. My dad, I used to say to him, Dad, when I pray, I think I mentioned this last week, I'd pray and I'd fall asleep. And I felt really bad about that. And I'd say, Dad, 
I feel terrible. When I pray at night, I fall asleep. My dad said, what's wrong with that? Well, I would think I shouldn't be falling asleep. So what's wrong with it? He said, son, is there any greater way to go to sleep than being at the feet of Jesus? Just never really thought of it like that. But he went on to say, now, don't get me wrong, if that's the only time you pray, yeah, there's a problem. But if you have a prayer life through the day and you're spending time talking to God and you're going through life with God and at night you, you say, man, i got to pray and I'm going to spend some time in prayer and no more you get into prayer, you fall asleep, then that's okay. Better than counting sheep. Right? Nothing wrong with that. Don't let Satan play on your mind that you're doing something wrong as long as that's not the only time you're praying. Now, what does he say here? Look, look at the verse again. Verse 17. When the righteous cry for help, I had a guy that was going to school with me at Word of Life Bible Institute. His name was Steve Smith. Big tall guy. He was about a head taller than me. And I remember one night we were in, um, we were in a chapel and this guy, man, he was on fire. He was preaching, talking about how that we ought, to be, we ought to be crying at the feet of Jesus, just committing our life to him, giving it all to him. As a believer, we ought to just be moved with great emotion to serve God and so forth and so on. And I remember we got to our dorm, and you have to understand, Steve was a very stoic kind of guy. His, his whole exterior was just that's who he was. Just kind of a quiet, solid person. And I remember he went to his desk, and he sat at his desk, and I could tell when I walked in, he was just distraught about something. I'm like, Steve, what's wrong? He said, John, he said, my whole life I've never been able to cry. He said, I remember when I buried my grandparents. He said, I love them dearly, but I never shed a tear at their funeral. He said, I wanted to. I even felt guilty that I wasn't crying. But he had the biggest heart. His heart cried, though tears never came out of his eyes. You ever saw a kid wail and cry and tears never came out of their eyes, but you knew they were really hurting, but there was no tears. Have you ever been so dried up with tears? You wailed, but you didn't cry because you didn't have any tears left to cry? Did you know it's physically possible to cry from the inside and not on the out? You know that? So if you're here today and you hear this passage, it says that God hears the cries of his people, and you go, man, that's just not, I don't cry. I can't cry. I'm not a crier. We're not talking about tears falling out of your eyes. We're talking about your lips crying out. Look, if your kids are in the other room and they're crying, you don't hear their tears. You hear their voice. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to cry out to Him. And for some, it may cause tears to come to the eyes, but not everybody. But we ought to all cry before God. We find here in this passage, it says in verse 17, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the, what is it? What's that next word? Near to the brokenhearted, and saves the what? The crushed spirit. The crushed spirit in the King James is a contrite spirit is what it says in the King James. And that has to do with a repentive spirit. A spirit of confession. A spirit of understanding who we are in the, in the, in the, in the view of who God is. And we realize that we're really a nobody and we admit that before God and confess it to him the scripture says in 1 John 1 9 if we confess our sin he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness that's what having a heart of contrition is we're to have a, a broken heart before God now you might be here and you may say pastor I've had that before but man I haven't had a broken heart before God in so many years I couldn't even tell you the last time I had I want to give you I want to give you a challenge I want to challenge you to get on your face before God someday somewhere at home when nobody's around and I want you to begin to call out to God and tell him you're not going to get off your knees till he breaks your cold stony heart 
There's been many times I've had to pray and ask God to do that. I'm tired of being hard-hearted about stuff. I'm tired of, of allowing myself to let the effects of what other people do around me affect my spirit. There's nobody that can change me except God. And I have to come before God with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. I've got to come into His presence. Those are essential in prayer. Broken heart and a contrite spirit. You want to connect to God in prayer? You want to have a real prayer life? Listen, a real prayer life is not praying for your food. Oh yeah, I pray. I pray. I pray for food. I even pray for my family. Praise God, I'm glad you do those things. But if that is all your prayer life is consistent of, you are not going into the wilderness and spending serious time with God. See, Jesus went in the wilderness for 40 days, and while He was there... He prayed and he fasted for 40 days. And the reason we know that is because when he came out of the wilderness, here comes Satan along and he said, Hey, Jesus, see those stones there? Why don't you turn them to bread so you can eat? Well, what kind of temptation is that for somebody who's not hungry? He is hungry because he hadn't ate, because he had been fasting and praying, emptying himself. Hear me for a minute. The wilderness place that Jesus went to for 40 years or for 40 days is that place of brokenness. If something was relentlessly for 40 days, boom, boom, boom on you every single day, I guarantee you in 40 days you would be broken. We need to get in the presence of God. We need to pray that God would break our cold, stony heart. That we would allow Him to soften us up, to use us, to quit being so bitter and so angry. Not allowing the things of life to dictate how we're going to live our life as a believer. But we're going to allow the Spirit of God to set us free to move out, to accomplish the things that only God wants to accomplish in your life. And only He can do it. But it requires you to get into His presence. Because apart from His presence, you're nothing. You're useless. The last verse I want to give you is found in Psalm 51 and verse 17. Look at it. It says, the sacrifices of God. What are they? Oh, it's, you know, it's uh, loving on my kids. It's giving to other people when they have need and blah, blah, blah. And we can say all these different things that were sacrifices of God. It's going to church on a Sunday morning when there's other things I could be doing, but I'm making a sacrifice to God. No, here's what it says. The sacrifices, of, and by the way, those sacrifices, there's nothing wrong with them, but they should all flow out of this sacrifice. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. It's essential sensual in your life as a believer are you there are you finding yourself in that place where you are connecting with this in a way that you understand man I've been going to gym I've been going to ball practice without my tennis shoes I've been going to these places I've been metaphorically speaking that's what I've been doing I've been going to prayer I've been praying to God for different things and, and all this, but it's like I'm going without the essentials. And that's got to change. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I want you